This mitzvah podcast is sponsored by Pascal Sharp in honor of her husband Martin and children Hazel and Daniel, and in special appreciation of the Torch Rabbis, their dedication to spreading Torah to the Houston Jewish community and beyond. If you want to sponsor a mitzvah podcast, or you want to reach out for any reason at all, you want to give me any comments or questions, email me please, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. We're up to mitzvah number 30. This is the third of the Ten Commandments. Lo sis Hashem HaKachal Do not take God's name in vain. Don't swear needlessly, pointlessly using the name of God. Now there is an entire body of mitzvot in the Torah related to swearing and oaths and vows. A nazir is also a variant of this. Uh, we're going to talk today about two particular mitzvahs. Mitzvah number 30, not to swear in vain, not to take God's name in vain. And mitzvah number 227, which is not to swear falsely. And the reason why we're going to lump them together, very similar. They're both kinds of oaths or swearing that is improper. And in fact, the Sefer Chinuch, the book that we're using to guide us through the mitzvahs, he lumps the two together. He says, really, there are two varieties of the same prohibition, so therefore we're going to do the same. So what's the difference between swearing in vain, swearing needlessly, swearing pointlessly, versus swearing falsely? So the Sefer Chinuch tells us that there's four different kinds of oaths in vain, needless oaths. So the first one is things that are obviously false. For example, this is his example. If you swear on a pillar of marble and you say, I swear in the name of God, this is a pillar of gold, it's obviously false. You're swearing falsely in vain. It's not considered swearing falsely. It's considered swearing in vain. You know, I always tell my children when someone tells them, you're so stupid or you're so ugly, I say to them, well, if someone tells you that the sky is green and the grass is blue, you're not going to listen to them because it's obviously not true. So why would you listen to this person who's saying that? It's not obviously not true. But that would be an example of swearing in vain because it's not false because it's only swearing falsely when it's in the gray zone. You know, when it could be true, it could, be not, could not be true. But here when it's evidently not true, it's swearing in vain. The second example of swearing in vain is when someone swears about something which is obviously true. For example, the example that he gives, you take a stone, you say, I swear in the name of God this is a stone. Or I swear in the name of God that this is a stick. If you do something like that, it's a true oath, but it's an oath in vain. The third example is where you swear to not fulfill a mitzvah. You say, I swear that I'm not going to do X, Y, or Z. And the, re- and the reason why that's considered an oath in vain is because you are, you are already obligated to fulfill the mitzvah. And therefore, it's as if that y- you're already kind of on that team, and therefore doing that, it's like evidently untrue. It's like swearing about something which is obviously false. It's like swearing about the sky that's green and the grass that's blue. And the fourth example that he gives is where you swear to do something which is impossible. For example, he quotes the Talmud. The Talmud says that if someone swears that they won't sleep for three days, that is considered an oath in vain. In fact, the Talmud does tell us that if someone swears falsely or someone swears in vain, that is actually an exception to the rule that there is no punishment of malchus, of lashes, for prohibitions of speech. Normally, there's a general rule in Torah that unless someone did an action, the the punishment for their misdeed cannot be lashes. However, because this particular mitzvah is so serious, you're using God's name in vain. It's so serious, you, you even get lashes for sins of speech. Says the Talmud, if someone swears, I'm not going to sleep for three days, says the Talmud, it's not possible biologically, everyone needs to sleep, and therefore they get lashes. When do they get lashes? Not two days later when they finally fall asleep, but right away now. Because they've already transgressed the prohibition of using God's name in vain. Uh, another example, if someone swears they're not going to eat for seven days, or I'm not going to, I'm going to swim underwater for ten minutes. Things, again, that are not possible, given the constraints of biology and physics, 
those things are, if someone swears to do them or to not do them, they will be considered an oath in vain. So those are the four examples of an oath in vain. What about examples of mitzvah number 227, not to swear falsely, not to use God's name for falsely? So he, so that also breaks down into four different categories, two in the past, two in the future. Either I swear I did or I swear I did not do something yesterday or I swear I will do or I swear I won't do something in the future. So Pat. Past, positive and negative. Future, positive and negative. And this is not those things that are either patently true, patently untrue, things that are infeasible. This is all the other things where someone could do it, could not do it. You swear that I uh, I ate Chinese food yesterday. It's possible that someone ate Chinese food yesterday. But if they didn't do it, then they swore, in, they swore falsely. Uh, or I threw a stone into the ocean. It's something which is physically possible. It's reasonable to expect that someone may have done that. But if it's not true, if it's wearing falsely, they have transgressed that. Okay, so 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 what's this general idea? Like what's this idea that we have the ability to make these spiritual realities, we can make these oaths and those oaths are binding and if we transgress those oaths we get punished and if we use God's name in vain, that is also a problem. Like what's this? And remember, this is in the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments we think of them as being central pillars of belief. You know, we talk about first of the Ten Commandments is to believe in God and then not to do idolatry. Those things are obviously the pillars of our religion. And what's the very next of the Ten Commandments? To not use God's name in vain. It seems to be something that if you know, if we had to make our own hierarchy of mitzvos and order them from most important to least important. You know, when someone swears, oh, I swear, in the name of God, I'm going to do this. It, it seems like, yeah, maybe it's a problem. It's sacrilegious. But is it really Ten Commandments level? It seems to us that like it's, it would not necessarily be so. Uh, yet we find that there's very um, grave laws about all manners of speech. We're all familiar with the laws of Lashon Hara. But the laws of oaths, the laws, uh, Kol Nidre, for example, the beginning of Yom Kippur, that seems like usher in the holiest day, the day of atonement. What do we start with? We start with Kol Nidre. What does the word Nidre mean? Nidre means vows. All my vows, I want to nullify. And what do we do the day before Rosh Hashanah? We do what's called Hatarat Nidarim, which means absolvement of vows, annulment of vows. Why? Because it's a terrible thing when someone makes a verbal pledge to do something or to not do something and they don't keep their words, which is why there is a, a saying that is prevalent in some Jewish communities where someone says, I will do this, and then they add, bli neder, which doesn't sound like anything in English, but bli means without, neder means a vow. And there's like an aversion that's thousands of years old in Jewish culture to making vows or oaths or swearing because there's tremendous severity to these prohibitions. Why? So I want to read to you what the Sefer Chinuch writes. People must know and establish in their souls and strengthen their faith in their hearts that the Almighty, blessed is He, who is in the heavens above, who is around forever, who will live forever. There is no existence like His existence. There is no parallel between human existence, between our corporeal existence, between a temporal existence and God. And therefore, it's appropriate and it's obligatory upon us that when we invoke his great name on our deeds and on our speech, to invoke it with fear, with dread, with reverence, with awe, with trembling, not like casually, flippantly, in jest, as if we're speaking about something very minor, like the things that don't really matter. Because when we do that, we're actually downgrading God to our world. When we kind of talk about God in the same way we talk about things in our world, then we're, we're transgressing a major theological sin, so to speak, by taking God and making him mundane, by downgrading him from being something which is so beyond us, something which is so great and vast and awesome and powerful, 
to be something very like nonchalant, very willy nilly, things that are not so important, things that are around in our world and things that don't really matter. And therefore, in order to firmly establish this in our heart, that our fear of God should be ever present, we were commanded with this mitzvah to not take God's name in vain. And he adds, and if someone does, they are punished with lashes, even though this is something which is a sin of speech, which generally does not have those harsh punishments. And then he explains that this is the same reason why it's prohibited to swear falsely. Because what happens when someone swears? When someone swears, they say, I swear I will do X, Y, or Z, or I swear I will not do X, Y, or Z. And they're linking that to God. I swear in the name of God, I will eat a hot dog today, right? Someone makes that statement. What they're doing is, when they're invoking the name of God, they're invoking God, which is an idea, which is present, which is omnipotent, which is the most real thing in the world. And when I'm saying I pledge to make what I am saying I, in the name of God, what I'm saying is there's equivalence between the two halves of my statement. I will do this in the name of God. Meaning, just as the name of God is so fixed and is so inflexible and it's the one existence that's not dependent upon anything else. It's the one true existence that was here beforehand and that was that will be after everything else. I am linking my pledge to that reality. That's what an oath is. And then what happens when someone swears falsely? When someone swears falsely, they're in effect saying, I swore that I'm going to eat the hot dog in the name of God. I didn't eat the hot dog. What does that say about how I view God? It says that I also view God as something which is, yeah, is it is it there? Is it not there? Is it true? Is it not true? I could say it. it's it's trivial. It's not, it's not something which is sacrosanct. It's not something which is fixed, which is definitive. It's not something which is always present. And that's the major sin of swearing falsely. It is that it's in, a, in effect, it's a tacit denial of God's existence. This is the exact reason why when, when someone in, 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 in a Jewish court of law would be obligated to make an oath because it's an oath of something very severe. Like, you, you know, you put your hand in the Bible like people do today, but that's in effect what people used to do in the past when in a Jewish system of laws. And that would be a way to ensure people wouldn't be lying because people would be very, very serious about it. This is not something you joke around with. And therefore, when someone swears on all that's holy, then we could – pretty much that's a verification in absence of another verification. So an example of that would be if let's say um, someone comes and two people come to court, the two litigants come to court, and one of them says that this guy owes me money. He owes me $100. So the court will ask him, well, do you have proof? Do you have a document? Do you have witnesses, mm-hmm. something like that, that you lent them the money? So if you have a document or if you have witnesses, then the guy would be forced to pay the $100, right? What if you don't have? You only have one witness. So if you have no witnesses, the guy says, listen, I, I deny it all and I don't need to pay anything. But there's two instances where the guy will be obligated to swear an oath that he's not liable. Either if you have one witness. So... Ruvain says Shimon owes him $100 and he brings Levi, the third guy, as a one witness, not two witnesses. Yeah, Levi says, yes, I'm a witness that Ruvain lent him $100. It's not enough to obligate obligate him to pay, but Shimon, if he doesn't want to pay, if he denies it, will have to make an oath that he indeed is not liable, not uh, obligated to pay the $100. That's the first example where someone would need to make an oath. The second example would be is... If Ruvain says in court, Shimon owes me $100, he borrowed the money, whatever whatever it may be, I have no witnesses, but he owes me $100. And Shimon says, it wasn't $100, it was actually 50 50 it was, but not 100 So that's called Mode de Satina. He is admitting to partial, partially, he's partially admitting to the claim. And the halacha is, when someone's Mode de when someone admits in a partial claim, they have to swear that they don't owe the rest of the claim. So they would, they would pay the 50, and the other 50, they have to swear in the court of law that I am not, uh, uh, that I don't owe you that other 50. But the reason why this was efficacious is because people take the oath very seriously. 
everything that they believe is linked to what other claim they're making. I believe in God, and I believe with the same sincerity and same deep belief that I don't only have 50, that's something that people are very worried to say, and that's an external verification of the veracity of their claims. So the Sefer Chinuch, actually, if you look in the actual text, it's a very, very long piece. It's by far the longest piece that we've seen till now. And the reason why, because he gets, the reason why it's so long is because he gives us an entire treatise on all kinds of prohibitions of speech. And he lists the different kinds of prohibitions, and then he lists the differences between them, and then he talks about why they're different. So for example, the idea of a neder. A neder is a, is a vow. What's the difference between a vow and an oath? So he explains the difference is, is that an oath, what's called a shvua, which that is uh, something which uh, orients around a person. Whereas a neder orients around an object. So for example, a, an oath, that would be, for example, me saying, I pledge or I swear to not eat a hot dog tonight. That would be an example of an oath. A neder would be, this hot dog is prohibited to anyone to eat as if it would be consecrated to the temple. So one of them orients around the person, one of them orients around the object. And there's all kinds of differences uh, stemming from that critical, fundamental, philosophical difference between the categories of the shavua, the oath, or the swearing, versus the neder. In fact, if you look at the Talmud, there's an entire book of Talmud called Nedarim, which means neders, plural neders. There's a book called Shavuos, which means oaths. There is, you could spend a whole life, lifetime studying the intricacies and the various permutations of these laws. And by the way, after a lifetime, you still won't have been finished. So there's a lot there. So we're going to go just the basics. So for, uh, one interesting uh, little uh, tidbit that he brings down over here is that uh, when someone makes a uh, an oath, someone swears, it has to be – it's only valid when they are sincere about it. So he gives an interesting question. The guy comes and puts a gun to your head, God forbid, or the pirate comes and says, well, where's the money? Or what's the code to the safe? Or give me the keys to your car or something like that. Are you allowed to swear falsely to be able to save your property? So the example that he gives is let's say you swear that this doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the sheriff or to the politician or to the king or to the pirates or to someone that they're terrified of or to the, the mob boss. The Don. It's his car. Are you allowed to say, I swear in the name of God, I will swear in the Torah. Is that prohibited? It's an interesting question. So the halacha is that you, your, your heart and your mind have to be in unison. Here, when you're just trying to kind of send the guy away to save your property, it's not considered an, a, a, a valid oath. Now, to further demonstrate how severe oaths and nidaram are, the Rambam tells us something very scary in the Laws of Oaths, uh, chapter 12. He says that even though when someone swears falsely or someone swears in vain, even though they get lashes, they would also, in addition, have to bring a sacrifice. So, well, There's, of course, sacrifices. We haven't gotten to that. But there's all kinds of different sacrifices, but there's a class of sacrifices called a chatas, which means a sacrifice that you bring because of a sin. It's a way of atonement. Here you need double atonement. You get lashes, which is a punishment, but really punishment's an atonement. God's the one in charge of punishment, where you know the, the mitzvahs that we have, the guidelines that we have to punish people just to give them an atonement. So even though you get lashes and you bring a sacrifice, says the Rambam, you're still not fully atoned for. You're still not fully expiated. He quotes a verse that you're never cleaned. You're not going to be cleaned completely until God will take care of you because you desecrated God's name. And therefore, concludes the Rambam, a person has to be careful and cautious with respect to this prohibition more than any other prohibition in the Torah. This is the thing you have to be most worried about, most concerned about, swearing falsely and swearing in vain. Now, one of the Hasidic masters says something very clever, 
we know that repentance works. So why would this particular mitzvah or particular prohibition, why is it so severe, even if someone gets lashes and even if they bring a sacrifice and they're not fully expiated? Why not? Why can't they be fully atoned? So one of the Hasidic masters some, says something very clever. He says, well, in heaven, there's a ledger. And in the ledger, everything that someone does is written down in ledger, both good and bad. So someone does a mitzvah, it's written in the ledger. Someone does a sin, it's written in the ledger. Well, what happens when someone sins and swears falsely? I swear in the name of God, I'm going to eat the hot dog, right? You don't do it. Well, what does it say in the ledger? I swear that this gentleman wrote, I swear X, Y, and Z didn't fulfill it. Well, if someone wants to have atonement, someone wants to have repentance, well, what happens to the ledger? The ledger gets erased. That particular entry, the guy did repent it. They quickly bring the ledger back and they would erase the, the item in the ledger that was the original transgression. Well, what happens over here? What does it say? It says, I swear in the name of God. There's a prohibition to erase the name of God. Prohibition we haven't seen yet, but it's a prohibition. So in the heavenly ledger, they can't erase it fully because you can't erase that. So therefore, there's there's always going to be a remnant of that sin. You can't have full atonement for it. That's the Hasidic uh, idea from the masters. Now, regarding the question as to whether or not this is prohibited only with respect to actually invoking the name of God, or it applies for any time of swearing or oath, or maybe even any pledge. So the Shulchan Aruch, which is a book of Jewish law, the Code of Jewish Law, he tells us, uh, he has an entire chapter dedicated to this question. This is in Yoridea number 237. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch is broken down into four general sections, Arachaim, Yoridea, Choshen Mishpat, and Evan Ezer. In Yoridea, Chapter 237, he dedicates that to this question, and he, and he says, if someone says, I swear that I will do this and that, this, this or that, or I will not do this or that, behold, this is considered an oath, even though he did not invoke the name of God, and not even the nickname of God. And there's no difference if he said it in Hebrew, or in English, or in any other language. So that's the answer to the question, that this would apply even if someone does not use the name of God, if they use any sort of terminology of I swear or I, maybe even I pledge. Again, this is kind of the gray territory. But if, if someone uses a terminology of pledging to do something, they're obligated to fulfill it. And if they don't fulfill it, they're transgressing in swearing falsely. And certainly with respect to the name, the, t- taking God's name in vain, all these prohibitions should be enough to warn us to be very careful to tiptoe around this entire area and it's good practices when you make a pledge or make a promise or make an oath or swear to add the caveat, to add the disclaimer, I'm doing it blineder, or I'm doing it without a neder, without a shvua, without a chen, without a konam, without a iser, all these, these are all different terminologies of, of, um, of oaths. Uh, or say I'm doing it God willing or whatever, some way to detract from it having the, the status of a halachic oath. To conclude, I want to uh, read a midrash about Moses uh, because the midrash quotes a verse in Psalms and the verse in Psalms says, Mi ya'ale bahar Hashem, who will ascend the mountain of God? And who will stand up in his holy place? And it gives a list of four requirements. What are the four requirements to stand up and ascend the mountain of God? Someone who has clean hands. Someone who has a wholesome heart. Did not take my name in vain. Which is this prohibition. Prohibition number 30. Velo nishbalim irma didn't swear falsely, which is 227. Says the Midrash, who, do, who fulfilled all four of these categories? Nikitapai, Zemosha, that's Moshe. And he gives a story about how Moshe had clean hands. He didn't steal anything. He didn't take anyone else's money. He walked into the coffers of the Mishkan with special tailored clothing that didn't have any pockets. He didn't take anything from the public coffers. Ubarli Bav, who had a wholesome heart? Moshe. Asher lo nasal shav nafshi, Moshe. Moshe. Moshe fulfilled all these, pro- these 
restrictions. He, he exemplified someone who did not swear falsely and did not take God's name in vain. And therefore, he ascended the mountain of God, which is an amazing idea that Moshe, the reason why, we're told in the Midrash, the reason why Moshe was the best candidate to be the one who was the greatest prophet and the one who gave us the Torah was specifically because of these four things. And the last two of them are these two mitzvahs. They just were falsely, didn't take God's name in vain. What are the stories of how do we know that how do we know that Moses did not take God's name in vain and didn't swear falsely? So it gives us two stories. Story number one is at the very, very beginning of Moshe's life, as an adult, he walks out and he sees an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man. So what does Moshe do? He kills him and buries him in the sand. And then the next day, the two Jews are fighting and Moshe again intervenes. This is chapter 2 of Exodus. And they say to him, oh, are you going to kill us like you killed the guy yesterday? And they go, of course, in tattletale to Pharaoh and Moshe has to flee because Pharaoh wants to kill him. And he ends up in Midian, marries uh, Yisro's daughter. And then many, many years later, the burning bush sends him back to Egypt. And of course, the rest is the rest of the Torah. How did Moshe kill the Egyptian man? So Rashi tells us, based upon the exchange that happened between the two Jews the next day. Again, the next day Moshe goes and intervenes between a fight with the two Jews. And they say to him, Hale Hargeni Ata Omer, are you saying that you're going to kill me like you killed the guy yesterday? Says Rashi, that this is the source of the Talmud that Moshe killed the Egyptian guy yesterday by saying something. What did Moshe say? So he tells us that Moshe used the name of God, said the name of God to execute the Egyptian man. Says the Midrash, how do we know? Moshe, did Moshe use God's name in vain here? No, he says Moshe was prophetically able to see in this Egyptian man, A, what he did in the past that made him guilty of capital punishment, B, what his future looks like, is there any one of his future descendants, if he were to have descendants, are they going to convert to Judaism? I mean, are they going to have a spiritual soul of a Jew? And Moshe only did that, did, Moshe did, and Moshe did all that due diligence before he uttered the name of God to ensure that he didn't utter God's name in vain. And that shows that Moshe takes God's name seriously. That's the first example. And how do you know they didn't swear falsely? It gives a story from a few chapters later on. Moshe, of course, goes to Midian and he defends Yisro's seven daughters who are there by the well. And long story short, he marries Sipora, the daughter of Yisro. But he also makes a promise to his father-in-law that he's not going to leave the land of Midian without his permission, which seems fairly reasonable. If you're going to marry your daughter off to some uh, emigrant you want uh, to make sure that they're not going to run back. I guess that makes sense. Anyhow, what happens many years later, Moshe has a seven-day interaction with God, and after seven days of negotiation, God tells him, okay, you're, you're going now back to Egypt to go save the Jewish people, and eventually to bring them to Sinai, which is the mountain in which this exchange actually happened. The burning bush was at Sinai. And you're going to give him the Torah. In effect, Moshe is being tasked with the responsibility, the most important responsibility ever, to go bring the Jewish people out of Egypt and bring them to Sinai. And initially, of course, he doesn't want it. Send Aaron. What am I to tell them? They won't believe me. I, I can't speak well. All kinds of reasons and objections that Moshe doesn't want to do. But eventually, he signs off and he agrees. And what does he do? He goes back to Yisro. And he asked him for permission. Says Rashi. Why? Because of the original pledge. And Yisro was gracious enough to say, okay, go. What would have happened had Yisro said, no, stay here? It's evident from the story, despite the fact that God Almighty tells you to go to Egypt. Yisro, your pagan father-in-law tells you, no, 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 we made a deal. Moshe says, okay, sorry, God, I can't help you. Find someone else. And Moshe did the right thing. You would think he made a terrible mistake. You know God tells you to do something. And you go to ask Yisro, your father-in-law, because of some deal, like the circumstances have changed, uh, if I would have known, right? God tells me, doesn't matter what you say. No, none of that. Moshe did the right thing. And in fact, this is why he is qualified, because he didn't swear falsely. Well, what's going to be with the Jewish people? Who's going to save them? Moshe's the only one that can save them. Moshe's, what what Moshe is in, in fact saying is that the Jewish people were saved because of God. 
Not because of me. I'm just a messenger. And therefore, I'm expendable. Because God could, as easily as anything in the world, get another messenger. Really, God is saving, not me. If it was me saving, it means if I have a choice, I could save the whole Jewish people, millions of people who are suffering and being tortured and murdered. I made a promise to my father-in-law. If, if I had to make that choice, obviously, you can go save the people. But what Moshe is also demonstrating is that he realizes he's not saving the people, God is. And he's just a messenger. And therefore, if it's, I'm doing something wrong, I'm not going to do it. God will find a different messenger. The Jewish people will be saved regardless. And specifically because of that sensitivity to oaths, that's why Moshe was indeed the right person to ascend the mountain of God. So again, it's interesting. 50% of the reason, according to this Midrash, why Moshe was the best candidate to save the Jewish people to go up, ascend the mountain of God, was because of his sensitivity to taking God's name in vain, God forbid, and to not swearing falsely. So that's that, mitzvah number 30 and mitzvah number 227, to not swear falsely and to not take God's name in vain, to not swear needlessly, or to not invoke the name of God needlessly.